Hey, I'm Hashem. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope you're doing well. This is the Lomo Instant Square Camera with Glass Lens. It can produce some pretty nice photos, and it has a focal length that's not as wide as many other instant cameras, but it has certain quirks and limitations to bear in mind if you're thinking about buying one of these. I'm going to talk about those things as well as focus on the practical aspects of using this camera and compare it to the Fujifilm Instax SQ6, which I've reviewed on this channel a couple of years ago. So stick around for more, or you can even use the chapter markers below to skip ahead to the relevant section. A bit of background first, in that the Fuji SQ6 that I was actually using since that review had recently stopped working out of nowhere. It was some kind of electronic issue by the looks of it. It just wouldn't turn on or it would sort of make a little click, but the lens wouldn't extend. So sometime after that, Lomography sent me one of their instant square glass cameras to try out and make a review on. Now the video isn't sponsored and I wasn't paid by Lomo to give any particular opinion. So I'm gonna give my honest thoughts on what I like about the camera, but also what I don't like. And there is a little bit to mention there. Firstly, on the specs and features and stuff like that, I did a lot of research on this camera beforehand and found that there were a lot of video reviews out there already and uh, a lot of really good ones. And there's even some articles that you can find quite easily, including the actual specifications sheet on the website. So I'm not gonna really focus on that. I wanna try and offer something a little bit different to what's already out there. And amongst all the reviews I found on YouTube, there was one that I would refer you to that I thought was a fantastic review of this camera. It was by uh, Lauren from a channel called Photography Concentrate. And she covered everything really well, a really comprehensive video about 20 plus minutes long, including all of the features and aspects of usage and a lot of pros and cons that aligned with the findings that I had in my time using this camera. And that included a few of the critical aspects such as the auto exposure systems inconsistency. So I agreed with the general consensus that many other reviewers found. I really like the form factor, especially when it's packed down. It's kind of like just a big square sandwich looking thing. You can uh, put it in a jacket pocket, for example. It has a good sharp lens. I like the focal length. I like the controls such as the manual focus lever and exposure compensation and so on. But I also shared some of the gripes that other reviewers found, such as the inaccuracy of the auto exposure system. Another thing was the viewfinder. It isn't too good, to be honest. It's a little bit dim compared to even the SQ6. And there's a bit of reflection that you see on the sides of the viewfinder when you're looking through it. And uh, I'll, I'll show you that in the B-roll here. You can kind of see what I mean. So it's a little bit smaller and dimmer, plus the, the unusual way of indicating the parallax error. The placement of the shutter button is sort of okay uh, in terms of its convenience, but it's sort of flush with the camera. So the problem is you can accidentally press it as soon as you've turned the camera on, for example. And I only did that once, but it's a pretty expensive mistake. And uh, I didn't find myself doing that with the SQ6. So it takes the same Fuji Square instant film. And also because of its uh, increased focal length compared to other cameras and the glass lens, it can produce some really nice results with a sort of a classic Polaroid look. But when you take the longer focal length and that parallax error that's inherent to these types of cameras, it increases that margin for error in terms of your framing. The next thing is that the exposure system, it's generally okay, but it can be very hit and miss. And my one at least tended towards overexposure a fair bit of the time. So having that exposure compensation button definitely helps. It gives one stop plus or minus exposure compensation. And I generally found myself using it on minus one a lot of the time. One of the first things I wanted to try with this camera was to do some portraits. And Sarah and I had recently moved into this apartment that we're living in right now with a really 70s sort of retro uh, look and decor. And there's really nice light that comes in through the window sometimes. So I chose a morning for us to do some portraits of each other. And during that session, we found out that the exposure system can be really consistent. We had a lot of missed shots, a lot of wasted film. And I would say that the hit rate during those lighting conditions, which were a bit tricky, mind you, there were some high contrast lighting scenes. It was very hit and miss and uh, probably 40% of the shots were no good. But when the shots did land, they looked really good. So it is a little bit difficult trying to uh, estimate that focus distance because you don't have as much room for error, even though it uses somewhere between F10 and F22, it is sort of a large piece of film. So you can get a bit of shallow depth of field on this, 
if you really uh, frame and focus and uh, something with a portrait can come out really good as with this example here. But I definitely uh, had to learn the parallax error a little bit and how to use that viewfinder and get good framing as well as work with that exposure system. So even when trying to compensate with minus one, some shots would still be overexposed and vice versa. It was a little bit unpredictable with some shots. Another thing I liked about this camera is that it came with a little close-up lens that you could attach to the front, which brings the minimal focal distance down from about 80 centimeters to 50 centimeters, meaning you can focus on subjects pretty close. And because it has a, a lens focal length equivalent to about 45 millimeters in 35 mil terms, I think that that portrait close-up lens brings it closer to 60 plus millimeters. So you can imagine it's suitable for something like selfies, for example, or taking close-ups, but you don't have as much room for error yet again because of the parallax error and there's no extra compensation in that viewfinder to account for it. So I had tried this a couple of times in that portrait session, found it was a difficulty in terms of framing as well as gaining focus 50 centimeters away and trying to maintain everything. So I feel like that close-up lens can have some good use and I tried using it on a tripod, which I found gave me much better results trying to really accurately measure how far I was from the subject and keep everything still. So I do have this example here with the phone that turned out pretty good using that close-up lens, but I feel like there is even more room for error when trying to use that, especially if your subject is up close and you're not used to dealing with that parallax error just yet. And for general and outdoor use, I found this is where the camera excelled the most in my usage. And because of the fact that we were in lockdown for most of the time that I had access to this camera, I was limited to my usage. I couldn't really go out and take many traditional landscapes. It was just sort of used on some of my daily walks around the neighborhood. And uh, I found that it worked quite well in these situations. I did find myself at that point having learnt to compensate the exposure and use minus one. For example, with all of these four shots, they were all taken at the negative one exposure compensation on the camera, which I found gave satisfactory results. You have to remember also that the dynamic range of Instax film and instant film in general is quite limited. You really don't have too much room for error when it comes to over or under exposure, which is why shooting high contrast scenes may not be the most ideal. I prefer to lean towards underexposure because the highlights do blow out pretty easily with this film. So I'd rather my uh, shadows go dark with shots like this, for example, and at least have good detail in the highlights. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the Lomo Instant Square compared to the Fuji SQ6 camera, which I've reviewed before on the channel. So my original one, the gray one had broken and uh, I was lucky enough to get another one from my friend Daniel. So thanks Daniel, if you're watching and use it for a little bit of a comparison. Now, the main thing you'll probably notice, obviously the build uh, form factor and the size being a little bit different, but more importantly, the focal length on the SQ6 and most Fuji Instax cameras is wider. So they're a little bit easier to use and compose with with less parallax error. But to show that, I've got this uh, image of a guitar taken from equal distances apart with both cameras set on a tripod. I just swapped the camera and you can see how much wider the Fuji camera is. So that really shows you the main difference in terms of practical usage between these two cameras. You'll find that you can actually get a shallow depth of field with the Lomo camera that you can't really achieve with this one, even if, unless you focus on something really close perhaps. The other differences are in terms of the actual refinement. I feel like the Fuji camera is a fair bit more refined in terms of its button layout and ergonomics. The Fuji SQ6 is also a lot easier to use this I think is aimed at people who are more of an enthusiast level photographer who don't mind that manual uh, focus or range focusing system, which is essentially the same on this, except you have to use a button. But again, this has a, a more depth of field, so it's not as easy to miss focus with this one, even if you're a little bit off with your selected focus setting. The Lomo, however, does give you more fine tuned controls and the ability to combine a lot of the different modes, such as combining uh, infinity focus with exposure compensation, for example, something you can't do on this one. You can't, for example, combine the landscape focus setting with the lighten or darken setting, which it does have, but it's pretty limited in terms of combining all of those top modes on the camera. Whereas the Lomo has a separate button for each of the modes, letting you mix and match a lot of those different features such as multiple exposures and so on. 
So overall, I think if you were choosing between these two, I would recommend this for just general usage for anyone just getting into it who wants ease of use and a camera that's just going to give you a higher hit rate of images and less wasted film. But on the other hand, I'd recommend the Lomo for anyone who's a little bit more of a manual control user who, for example, understands a little bit of the difference when it comes to focal lengths and ranges and zone focusing and uh, how to use some of these features to their best advantage. So with all that in mind, it has a lower hit rate and meaning you'll have more wasted film, especially because of that slightly inaccurate auto exposure system, which at least in my case was a little bit unpredictable and something I also saw in other people's reviews. So just to demonstrate that, I've got a couple of piles of uh, photos here and this pile was my successful shots and that was some of the duds, the just shots that were just no good. And you can see that the ratio there is about 60 to 40. So 60% successful. And with time, as I got used to the framing of the camera, how to account for the uh, parallax error and the fo focusing distances and that exposure system by compensating, for example, that hit rate increased a little bit, probably went up to about 70, 30 or even better. If you don't mind burning through a bit of film, this camera can produce some fantastic results, especially with all the features it has and the add-ons like the close-up lens and the flash filters and even has the splitzer and other things you can get for it. You can even shoot Instax mini film. There's a separate back you can get for it. I didn't get it with my copy of the camera, but that is an option that you can have with it, for example. So it's almost two camera systems in one. So it is a really capable camera. and it can give you results that you just can't get with other cameras unless you were to adapt instant square film onto a medium format camera with full manual control. I feel like this is probably the next best thing, at least as far as I've seen, unless you're spending a lot of money on something like the Mint camera. So I wanna thank Lomography for sending me the instant square camera. I feel like they're always coming up with new things, trying to innovate and uh, really support the film photography community. And who knows, they might come up with an updated version sometime down the track, improve upon some of those things that could be improved on. And let me know your thoughts. Has anyone out there used this camera or owns one and experienced the same things that I found when it came to the auto exposure system, for example? How have you worked around it? What are your thoughts? Let me know, I'd be keen to hear. So thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next Pushing Film video.